All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's approximately 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and I wanted to welcome everyone. My name is William Moore, and we will go ahead and begin today's webinar. So again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Supporting Heroes in Mental Health Foundation Training, Maintaining Your Balance, Resiliency Action Plan. My name is William Moore, and I am with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. As your technical host, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. For those wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here, you will also find an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Click on the file, then click on the download button, and you will receive the file onto your desktop. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a private chat message directly to the host. At the end of today's webinar, we will be there will be a Q&A session where the presenters will address some of the questions posted during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a few minutes to help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. At the conclusion of today's web meet, webinar, you will be provided with a link to a brief survey about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to assist in future planning and training. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye out on your email for your certificate. And finally, the webinar recording for this event will be archived in approximately one week on OJJDP's InTech YouTube channel, where you can also view additional training resources. Supporting materials and the webinar transcript can be obtained by contacting OJJDP's TTA Help Desk. And again, thank you for joining us today. I will now turn it over to our moderator for the Innocent Justice Foundation, Ms. Beth Medina, for today's webinar. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess I could say there's people from all over, so good morning, good afternoon. Um, it's, it's great to see so many people from all over the country. Um, my name is Beth Medina. I am the CEO of the Innocent Justice Foundation and the program manager of Shift Wellness. Uh, Elizabeth, you will see on the moderator's forum that Elizabeth Tao, our program manager, um, is not going to be joining us today. She had a family emergency, so we'll send her well wishes, and, um, and we will carry on while she's handling what she needs to take care of. So um, I want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is one of several webinars we've been doing over the past month, kind of bringing wellness out to the forefront in different ways and, and delivering you some ideas and tools to help build resiliency. And we started doing these uh, trainings many years ago for the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force teams all across the nation. We have a grant from OJJDP to bring this training to ICAC and their, their affiliates. And we do day-long trainings where we teach about vicarious trauma and the physiological effects of working with really caustic material and give, uh, try to give tools and techniques to help mitigate the negative effects of chronic exposure to trauma, whether it be traumatic material or situations. 
so we uh, determined that this is also another way for us to give, uh, doing these webinars is another way for us to give more information and maybe take some of the basic information and, and dive a little deeper even. So uh, we have asked one of our terrific trainers. Uh, we always train with one mental health professional and one law enforcement professional when we do our day-long training for ICAC. And um, we ha so joining us today is Carol Gruska, and she is one of our trainers, and she's fantastic. She's done some of these uh, webinars in the past, so you will, if you have joined us before, you will recognize her. She always gives tons and tons of really good information. So uh, please feel free to ask questions, and I will make sure to take those questions to Carol. And um, at any time, you know, you can just put a question in the Q&A area, and, uh, and we'll try to stay on top of those. Enjoy. Thanks so much. And I'll turn it over to Carol. Hi. My name is Carol Bruska. I am the embedded mental health provider for the New Mexico ICAC Task Force, and I'm a trainer with the Innocent Justice Foundation SHIFT program. I've been in the mental health field for many years. I'm an independently licensed um, marriage and family therapist, and I've worked with clients with trauma. I've worked with um, families with individuals with severely disabling mental illness. So I've discovered that I really love the piece about being able to help people through their wellness and resilience. And because of that, I've been able to have the wonderful opportunity of doing several webinars that have been building on wellness and resilience. And if you have the opportunity to go back and look at the previous uh, webinars that we have, you'll see that each one kind of builds on the next. And this is the one, um, in this particular one, we're going to be talking about how to get your own wellness plan together and your own resiliency plan so that you can then have a daily practice of keeping yourself healthy. So our objectives today, I'm going to introduce what SHIFT is, um, and that's the program that we talked about initially. That's um, the program that I train out of. We're going to talk about what resiliency is and how to maintain resiliency, not only during your career, but during through life changes and inside of work and outside of work. We're going to explore resiliency skills for dealing with different types of stress reactions. And then lastly, we're going to incorporate resiliency mission statement and an action plan. So hopefully by the end of today, there'll be um, you'll have a good sense of how you can begin to build your own resiliency plan. If you look up at the top of your page, there should be something that says handouts. So um, if you look at those handouts, there's something called your personal mission statement and the resiliency action plan. So if you have the opportunity to print those out, you can start working on your own plan as well. So we wanted to make sure people had access to this so that they would be able to um, start their own plan right away and not have to begin the process of what that would look like. So first I'd like to discuss what SHIFT is. SHIFT is about awareness and education. And I think initially when we started, when SHIFT started out, it was awareness and education for ICAC. And then over time it's really expanded to awareness and education for ICAC and affiliates and family members and others that are impacted by this work. So we've really grown and adapted to what we find is the need. And I think it's been a benefit for, um, for everyone. We are talk what we talk about is preventative. We don't talk about um, that, you know, if you have symptoms of stress or symptoms of vicarious trauma, then that's the end of your work. You need to quit. What we talk about is you already are healthy. We believe that you're healthy, and we want to take what you're already using in your life as resiliency skills, as things that help you decrease stress and make you feel better, and then broaden those and, and make you aware of what you're doing so you can use those both at work and at home. SHIFT is not treatment and counseling. During this program, we're not going to be talking about um, particular issues that people might be struggling with or counseling for that. It's not about fitness for duty, and it's not about screening. So one of the things that we like to make people understand is this is a lot of education that we're going to give you and it's going to be things that you can walk away with today. So what is resiliency? Um, we see it, you know, there's, right here is what the, uh, the dictionary says. It's the ability to become strong or healthy and successful after something bad happens. But it's, for us, it's much more than that. We see people who day in and day out do this incredible work 
and then they come back the next day and do it again. We see the resilience in people on a daily basis when even though things have not gone the way that they would have liked to, they realize that there's many times that things will be better. So resilience is the, be the ability to kind of uh, bounce back. When life hands you lemons, it's the proverbial make lemonade. So that's what, we're gonna, that's what resiliency is, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the good news is that people who experience trauma and integrate it are recover or stronger and more resilient than people in general. This came out of a study that was done after 9-11 where they um, looked at people who had, ex had been through 9-11 and the traumatic effect that it had on them and then following them through to see that after a period of time they were able to bounce back and actually many of them experienced being feeling that they were stronger mentally and more able to adapt to other changes. Um, once you've been through something so traumatic, other life stressors don't necessarily seem to be as impactful as something so huge as 9-11. So we know through research that um, you can experience trauma and come out the other side, and you will be stronger for it. Whenever I see this slide, I always think of that expression, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and that I, I hold that to be true. It's, when you experience something traumatic and you're able to get through the other side, then you are more able then to be able to um, tackle other challenges. You have that experience that you can look back on and you can say, you know, I know this was difficult and it feels like it's never going to get better or it feels like things won't change, but life experience tells me that when difficult times happen, there is always going to be change and typically that change will be for the better. So the, re the ways to build resilience, presence and use of support, social support. That is the number one indicator of um, resilience. And it's not just a matter of having people around you that you can lean on. It's actually calling them when you're struggling or reaching out to them. And it doesn't mean that you have to use them as your therapist. That means reaching out and say, hey, can we go to the gym today? Or can we just hang out? Can, we, um, can you come to my house and watch movies with me? It's using that social support because that's going to help build your resilience. And the ability to plan and take action is also very important. When you have the ability to plan and take action, it lets you know that there's a beginning and an end to your particular task. And it also gives you a sense of control, that sense of control that in one area you have some ability to have control is going to help you throughout every area. So if that means that your work lends itself to not being able to really plan very well, then make sure in your own life that you have an area where you can be in charge, where you can plan, where you can have that sense of control, because the feelings of empowerment that you get from that one area will help make you feel more confident and more resilient in other areas. Having a positive self-assessment is so important because the way we feel about ourselves and the way we look at ourselves is going to indicate how we are in the world. So if I feel like um, that I'm not very good at my job or that I'm not really um, an important person in the world, then that's how I'm going to view the world. It's If I view the world through that color lens, that's what I'm going to look for and that's what I'm going to see. So we know that you know, the expression about rose-colored glasses isn't, isn't necessarily a good thing, but try to put on those rose-colored glasses occasionally so we can say, okay, I was um, stuck in traffic today, but because I was stuck in traffic today, I got to hear this really great podcast that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to hear. You know, for everything that comes up as a barrier, see if there's something through that that we can take with us as a positive. Communication and problem-solving skills are so important because if we know how to solve a problem, we don't have to feel so helpless and hopeless. And if there's, you know, if we have a problem um, and we can't seem to solve it, that's the time to use our social support. Ask our supports, is there, have you come across this problem? And if so, what did you do? Tolerance and management of strong feelings and impulses is key because that will let us know that even when we're really upset, that if we still have some level of control. We know what we can do. So if I know that I'm having a really rough day and I'm very upset, then I know, okay, that means it's time for me to go out and take a walk. That means it's time for me to just step away from this problem for a minute. That means I just need to redirect my energy somewhere else. That will give me the sense of um, 
support and the sense of resilience that I need to have. So we're going to do a poll question right now. So if everyone could answer the poll question, what do you do to maintain your resilience? Okay, so I see, oh, there's a lot of results coming up. So um, talking to spouse is great. That's your social support. Sports, working out, exercise, that's going to be great. It's going to help you um, get rid of some of that cortisol and get you balanced again. Um, feeding the birds, that's wonderful because when you're outside, many of your senses are being stimulated in a positive way. And when that happens, that helps us get back to feeling better. Talking to coworkers, great. Singing, that's a wonderful one. Um, again, you're doing some deep breathing when you're singing. That's going to get some oxygen to your brain. And it's a joyful activity, which is going to help increase your mood. We've got some great ones here. Thank you for your, um, thank you for your feedback on this. Let's see if I um, – positive self-talk, that's wonderful. If you, can, if you can talk yourself out of something bad, that's your way ahead of the game. So great. And reading some – reading, walking outside, good. Looks like we've got some great um, – resources that you're already using in your own lives. That's fabulous. OK, so any other answers before we move on? OK, then let's go to the next slide. And here we go. So why is resiliency important? Because, like it here says here, the antonym of resilience is delicate, hard, and inflexible. If we go throughout our day being um, hard and inflexible, we're going to come across, we're going to be bumping into walls every day, all day long. If we have the ability to adapt and change to our environment, our situation, then that's going to make our life easier. It's just going to make us be able to navigate through the world in a better way. So if I go in in the morning and I insist on um, doing something a particular way, and that's not a possibility, I can either decide that I can adapt and do it the way that's possible for that day, or I can be upset about that all day and then let that impact my the rest of my day, and then I probably won't be as happy or as productive or get as much done. So there are reasons that we lose our resiliency. Um, sometimes we become too busy. So if we are caught up in the moment and we've got you know, multiple things on our plate at home and at work, we become very resilient. And when we are in high stress, we are less able to be flexible and adaptable. And during, then when that happens, then it makes in general life is more difficult. And also, sometimes we forget why we do the work. So when we've been when doing this type of work for some period of time, we kind of forget what made us get into it. So did we get into it because we really thought that we had some great skills that could help the people we're working with? Or did we really feel like it was a calling for us to do this type of work? Um, did we feel like that we just wanted to go out there and help people? When we lose sight of why we do the work, it makes the work more difficult. Certainly, too, being too stressed is very, very common. When we're too stressed, we don't have the, um, the ability to plan for things. We don't have the ability to focus on the positive. And then when we're not doing those things, our resilience, resiliency goes down. Negative outlook, outlook and having things that we feel are too difficult, again, that's going to make us feel overwhelmed, feel distressed. And when we're in that place, um, it's not as easy to have a positive outlook and to use our resiliency skills. The thing about using our resilience is that it's a practice that we do every day. We can't just call on it when it's, we're having a bad time because it won't be there to re, for us to remember. We need to practice it every day so then it becomes an automatic go-to in times of need. So there, this next slide talks about um, resiliency throughout life changes. There are things that we used to do that because of life circumstances we don't do anymore. So maybe when we were younger, we used to do things like have lots of hobbies. But um, then we had children, or we got married, or the level of our intensity of our work changed. And all of those eustas got stuck behind. 
And so the friends that we used to spend time with or the sports or even taking vacations, all of those things we think, well, in the future I'm going to do that. I used to do that and I enjoyed it, and in the future I'll do that. But if we don't plan for it today, then it might not ever happen. And the important thing about um, these the particular eustas is when we have the ability to plan and start imagining what those eustas felt like, then we can actually benefit from the same hormones that are produced when we were doing that. So maybe we used to take vacations. And if we can sit for a moment and recall the positive vacation we took and plan for a new vacation, we can already see the benefits of that vacation just by the hormones that are produced when we think about that. So the next poll question, name one thing that you used to do to maintain your resilience that you don't do anymore. Workout, draw, baking, golf. And you know, many times when I see these lists, the people that we used to do things for are ourselves. And we will extend ourselves to our coworkers, to our friends, to our family, to our children, and we always end up getting the short end of our own stick. So there's a lot of great things that people were doing in the past, and hopefully just being reminded today of the things that you were doing will help you to start doing those again. So dance like a crazy woman. I love that. Dancing is a fabulous thing to do because when your body moves, you've got the cortisol getting out of your system. Um, whether you're listening to music or the music in your head, that's to increase your mood. Um, just enjoying yourself and letting yourself not have to um, be anybody but who you want to be, that's a fabulous, fabulous um, Thing to do. Um, argue with my ex-wife. That was a, that, that, that's an interesting resiliency skill. Um, at some point, I'd love to hear how that helps. But if that helps, that's great. Journaling, um, spend time with friends, reading, baking, all of those are fabulous things that are very useful that um, can help build your resilience. Anybody else have anything you want to add? Okay, then why don't we go to the next slide then, William. Thank you. So through life changes, we have a tendency sometimes to forget to use our resiliency skills. Um, you know, we think about who we were many years ago and what we started doing in our work and how our life has changed over time. Obviously, we are not the same as we were when we were in our teens, um, which is a good thing uh, most, for most people. Um, but how have we changed and what do we have outside of life that's not just work? Sometimes what happens is when we're younger, we have a life that's full, we're going to school, and we have friends, and we have all of these other activities that keep us busy. And as we get older and we feel more responsible for um, particular things like work, like family, um, we lose our identity and we become just those few things. So one of the important things to consider when you're going to be working on your resiliency plan, when you're working on the steps for your mission statement, is who are you outside of work? When I think of myself outside of work, there's many things. I'm not just an employee. I'm not just um, someone who's a trainer or a therapist. There's more to myself than who, that, who I am. So I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm um, a friend. I'm a member of a knitting group. I am a baker. I am part of a street outreach team. I'm much, much more than just one thing, and it's important for us to think about that because then when, I, when we do stop working, um, when we retire, we have a plethora of things that we can do outside of just our work identity. Oftentimes when we're heavily involved in work, we get out of our job and we have no identity because that was our work. There's research that shows typically when people retire, there's a level of depression because they lose who they were, that identity. And what we're trying to do is encourage you to have many identities outside of employee so that when you do quit, you will know that your life will be full. 
And change is guaranteed. We know that. We know that life will change. People will come into our life or come out of our life. There's periods of time when maybe we have less struggles than we have now or more struggles than we have in the past. But it's accepting that life is full of change and that we will get through that change. That's what it's like to be resilient. So please tell us now, who are you outside of work? Good. I see dad, mom, aunt. Yep. Ah, aspiring chef. Oh, that's wonderful. An actor. Great. I am free. Church member. Wonderful. So it looks like it's not very difficult for everybody um, in this webinar today to think of all of the people that they are outside of work, which is going to really help to build your resilience. Wife, grandma, aunt, nerd. I like that. That's great. Herb club chair. Oh, wow. So there's some really interesting things um, of, and a variety of things that people are doing outside of work. And that's great. So we've got an animal activist, a traveler, farmer. Wonderful. So there's some really great um, options out here that people are um, getting into that is going to help them. So if all of us retired today, we would have more than just our work to get us by. Oh, somebody's a clown. Great. Great. This is lovely. This is fabulous. So please think about that. Continue to think about who you are outside of work and build on that. And if you find that you, have, you don't have the, um, as many identities outside of work as you would like, then that's certainly an area where you can start to build. It's not um, something that you, it's, it's an impossible task to accomplish. It takes a little bit of work. It takes um, an inventory of what's interesting to you. But it's certainly, certainly something that you, can, um, that you can increase in your life. Okay, William, can we go back to slides? Thank you. So what does normal stress look like? When we are experiencing normal stress, we have multiple types of reactions. We have physical, mental, emotional, um, cognitive reactions. When our physical reactions tend to be aches and pains, Maybe we're not sleeping as well. Maybe we're struggling with um, having a, a satisfying sex life or our appetite is very big or very small. And we might have a tendency to feel reactive. These are all wonderful ways that our body is telling us we need to pay attention. You need to pay attention because something's going on and we need to address it. So if you're feeling any of these things, then listen to what your body's trying to tell you. Maybe it's trying to tell you that you need to get more sleep, or maybe you need to get some exercise, or maybe just spend some time with friends. What are those resiliency skills that you already have in your life that you can try to see if you can get through this um, period of stress? So for physical skills, you could, you know, endurance, trying things and again and again, building up your endurance through um, physical exercise or trying something as, as, um, as challenging as maybe trying to do a marathon. Or maybe endurance means trying skiing for the first time. Just trying a new skill and sticking with it. Making sure that you've got good nutrition, that's going to help you physically. Not only will you feel better, but with better um, eating habits, you're going to be stronger and just um, better overall. Building your strength. And looking at recovery, what are we recovering from? Are we recovering from the breakup of a relationship? Are we recovering from a difficult financial year? What area are we recovering from in our own life? And what are the things that we need to do for ourselves to make that happen? Mental reactions as far as normal stress, confusion and forgetfulness. This happens because many times when we're stressed, we have a lot of cortisol that is emitted from our brain the hormone that's um, created by our brain, and that if there's too much cortisol, we can have some confusion and forgetfulness, so, which makes it difficult to make decisions. And then we're irritated, so we blame others. And then we're not as alert or on our game. And all of these things can then increase the amount of stress that we have, so it's a lose-lose situation. But for the resiliency skills we can use are changing our thinking. So think again, like I, like I discussed earlier. If you've had a rough day, was there something that you could learn from that? If something didn't go your way, how can you learn from that to make changes? We typically have um, a tendency to think of the bad things that happened during the day or the ways that we didn't succeed. But we also need to consider the ways we did succeed and what we did well. 
being adaptable is always important. Just kind of going with the flow sometimes, knowing that not everything is always going to go the way we'd like, but that's okay. And then having awareness, just really being aware of what's what we're feeling like, what our emotions are telling us. Again, our brain is saying, pay attention, something's not right, we need to do a little bit of work to get things back to status quo. Behavioral reactions, that again, stress, normal stress can um, affect our behaviors. So maybe we, behaviorally, we used to do things and now we're not doing those anymore. So maybe it used to be you love to go play tennis on the weekends and now the thought of going to play tennis is just too much work. Or maybe you used to have great communication with your spouse and now you've kind of shut down. That's something that's an indicator to tell you that you're, you've got a lot of stress in your life and what do you need to do about it. Some people turn to substances or, um, or they become suspicious or they change their situational reactions. Anything that your behaviors are telling you to say, this is some stress we need to pay attention, you need to figure out the, way, the best way for you to handle that. And I keep saying you need to figure this out because there's not one cookie-cutter answer to all of this. We all know ourselves better than other people know us. So I know that if I get to the point where I'm changing my communication and I'm withdrawing, I know what I need to do about that. And part of that is kind of collecting myself, spending some time thinking about how I'm feeling and why I'm feeling that way, and then really make an effort to communicate that with others. So for each of us, it's an individual experience. And if we just take some time to think about that and, and look at what it is that we know has worked in the past, to make us feel better and use those skills again, that's the best key that we, that's the best um, resiliency skill we can use. So we have um, what we talked about previously in the um, handouts, a resiliency action plan. And this is going to help us in several different ways. So the skills that we can use on our resiliency action plan are how do we increase our communication? So what do we do to make sure that our communications are the best that they can be? Are we explaining things clearly when we're talking to people and listening? Are we actually listening and hearing what they're saying? Or are we listening and then planning what we're going to say in reply? Because if we're listening and planning what we're going to say in reply, we're not actually hearing what they're saying. So communication is one of the number one things that we can do for ourselves. And whether that means looking eye to eye at that person, um, making sure that your phone is not anywhere near you, um, making sure that you don't have other distractions. If you're talking with your partner, touch part of those, so grab their hand, put your hand on their leg. Making that physical connection makes the communication much more, um, much more possible. Teamwork is always going to be a key. So if you've got people on your team that you are working with, um, whether that team is at home or in work, you want to make sure that you see how you can work together as a team to, to build your, reaction, uh, your resiliency action plan because we're stronger together. So what do we do that we can all do together as a team so we're not feeling so alone, so, um, so out um, by, um, left field by ourselves? And that goes right along with connectedness. If we feel like we are, have others have our back and we can have others back, that's going to make all the difference. It's going to make us feel like we have some resources that we wouldn't buy ourselves. So what does normal stress look like? Emotional reactions, feeling numb, becoming irritable. Um, negative views, feeling withdrawn. I think there's been times in our lives when probably most of us have felt this before. So when we get to that place where it feels like we don't have a reaction to anything or every single thing irritates us, again, that's our emotions saying, pay attention to me, we need a little bit of work here. And the resiliency skills around that? Well, let's look at purpose. How do we find out what our purpose is and how do we move forward with that purpose in mind? So if I don't have a purpose, then what, is the, what direction do I take? If I don't have a purpose, how do I know where I'm going? So what is my purpose in life? Is my purpose to help children? Is my purpose to be a great mom? Is my purpose to um, be a good friend? So take a look at your purpose and see how you can increase your understanding of that. And then what is my perspective? Do I look at things always through the negative? Do I have a tendency to try to see both sides of the story? How do I um, support myself emotionally by looking, using my perspective? 
And then core values. Again, these are all things that you can use in your um, your mission statement. What do I really believe, and what is my guiding? Um, what is the thing that I use to guide myself? Do I have a spiritual path that I use to guide myself? And do I stick with things? If I have those things in my life, then there's a greater chance that I will be able to succeed. So we have, um, like I said, there's a mission statement that we've listed there. And this really does. It says it guides where we're going in the big picture, and it really does do that. It's going to help us because it ask, makes us ask questions and write down answers that we might not have ever considered. As we know, most businesses have a mission statement. So everybody that's part of that business knows what the purpose is, what the direction is, where they're going, and how they get there. This is kind of like our roadmap. So if we're going to take a trip, and we, we just know we want to get from point A to point B, and we have no idea how we're going to do that, then it's a lot more difficult to get there. If we have guiding points along the way, if we have specific small goals that we reach, so tonight I want to get to Austin, tomorrow I want to get to Nashville, the next day I want to get so-and-so. If we know how our, what our plan is and how we're going to get there, then we actually can feel better about our plan, and we know when we're making progress. So the, the plan, the uh, mission statement, we can use this for not only ourselves but for our family. So I encourage families to do this because as each person, you know, if there's um, a husband, wife, and uh, children or sp two spouses and children, um, each individual spouse can, can make their own plan and then combine that together to make a family plan with your children. So. Everybody sits down and says what's important to them and what is our mission as a family and what are the guiding things that we feel are necessary for us to be successful and have a, worth, a life worth living. And then the resiliency action plan is going to be the step-by-step um, the step by steps that we take to create our mission statement. So before when I was talking about if we're going on a trip, we know what our plan is. We want to get from point A to point B. That's our mission statement. And then the resiliency action plan is those little steps that we take in between to get there. So when we think about a mission statement, we want you to look at what is important to you in your life. And this isn't just what is important to you at work, but it's in every area of your life, what is important. So sometimes people say it's important to live with integrity or it's important to be an honest person or it's important to um, make sure that I'm giving to others before myself. Whatever your, you find is important, write that down. And where do I want to go? So are you exactly where you want to be already? Do you feel like you've met those goals? Are you on track? And if you're not on track, what are the little steps you need to take to get you there? How do you want to act? So am I following what I believe to be my true mission by my actions? Because we can talk and talk and talk, but if our actions aren't following it up, then we need to make some adjustments. And what does best, the best look like for me? Because I can say I want to be the best mom, but for me, what does the best mom look like? And for me, the best mom might look very different than the best mom that Beth will be or the best mom that someone else out there will be. It has to be what comes from our heart and what we feel based on who we are. And what kind of legacy do we want to leave behind? Some of you are probably um, pretty young, in your 20s, maybe 30s, and so the thought of leaving a legacy behind isn't something that you've really considered. Now's the time to do that because that will give you plenty of years to get there. So the SMART goal worksheet result, we also have that attached there, so please take a look at that. This is setting out a goal for each of the things that you would like to achieve. So if these, if they're called SMART goals because they're specific, they're measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And the reason that they're, that they're called SMART goals, the reason that we want you to create SMART goals, is because they're very easy to track. So if I say my goal for the year is to lose weight, if I lose one ounce, then I could potentially say I've, lose, I've, I've achieved my goal. But if I say that my goal is to lose 10 pounds over the next year, then that's very specific. So 10 pounds over the next year. It's measurable. I know when I reach 10 pounds throughout the year. 
it is attainable. It's relevant because one of my goals is to be healthy. And so as a healthy individual, I would be better if I, um, I would be healthier if I lost 10 pounds. And it's time bound. I'm giving myself a year to do it. Not that you have a goal that's, that is around weight loss, but any goal that you choose, you can create that. So even if it's a goal such as, I would like to improve the quality time with my family. Well, I'm going to do that by spending every Wednesday as game night with my children over the next six months. So again, it's very specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it relates to my overall goal of being a good parent, and it's time bound. So um, do, does anybody at this point have any questions about our, um, what we talked about so far? So what we're hoping is that by giving you the opportunity to have a resiliency action plan, by having the SMART goals, and by creating your family mission statement or your individual mission statement, this will help to give you a guide. And, and I think it's great that we did this at the beginning of the year. We were initially going to do it at the end of last year, but doing it at the beginning of the year because oftentimes when we're creating goals, we kind of think the beginning of the year is a time of new opportunities. It's a time that we can create um, new things that we can do. And so this is the perfect time to really take a look at that. My suggestion, if you're going to do a resiliency action plan or you're going to create some goals, look at those once every three months or so. Sometimes people like to, um, as part of their mission statement to have a, a healthier family, they like to take a look at having a meeting, a family meeting once a week. Some people look at once a month. But it's important for us, if we're going to create a real resiliency plan and to have some SMART goals, that we actually follow up on it. It's not something that we just say, yep, this is what I'm going to do, and then don't look at it till next year. It's, again, it has to be an active process. It has to be a shift in how we do things so that it becomes habit, and then that helps us to build on those strengths and to build that resiliency in place. So again, does anybody have any questions that you'd like um, us to answer? Any clarifications that you'd like? Carol, we have a question from Karen okay. Ask, okay. A, asking if you could speak to about self-compassion and how we need to cut ourselves some slack around some of these issues. Absolutely. So um, I briefly mentioned it earlier that we, nobody is harder on us particularly, or nobody is, is harder on us generally than we are on ourselves. So for every good thing that we do, we don't see that. We see all the negatives. And it's so important to have compassion for ourselves and to be able to look at ourselves as human beings. We hold ourselves to this expectation that we are we, we should be able to do everything right all the time, that we should be able to get through life and not make mistakes or not hurt people's feelings or not do anything wrong. And, and when we would never treat someone else that way. We would never meet someone and expect that every word out of their mouth was eloquent and every decision they made was the correct one and everything they did was perfect. And yet sometimes we held ourselves to that standard, and that's unrealistic. We can only do the best that we can in the moment. I was talking um, just a couple weeks ago to Beth about, about a book that I read about perfection, and it says that if every moment we go into we are doing the best that we can, then that is perfection because perfection by definition is as good as it gets at that moment. So if we are doing the best that we can at that moment, then every moment is perfect. Now, what's perfect for us today might not be perfect for us tomorrow when we have more skill or more knowledge or more information. But in the moment, if we're trying our hardest, that's all we can do. And we have to give ourselves the compassion to say every moment isn't going to be a perfect moment in what in, in that there might not something might go wrong. And if something does go wrong, then we accept that what something went wrong and how can we learn from that and then what can we do better? And um, that to me is being able to um, incorporate some self-compassion. And certainly if you are looking at increasing your self-compassion, that's a perfect smart goal to have in your plan. How can I increase my self-compassion?
So Carol, um, <clears throat> do you recommend that people would go through the process, the SMART process, and the, um, the mission statement individually on their own first, and then if, if you want to include your family, bring your family after you've tried it out on your own and, and you kind of have a handle on the process that you use. Not that every process is the same, but. I would recommend that because certainly um, if you go through the process yourself, once trying it out, you're going to have um, a better understanding of what that process was like for you and how um, it will impact your life. And then it will be easier for you to un explain it to your loved ones or whoever it is that you're wanting to work on it with and then ask them if they would like to do it. Because just because I have a resiliency plan or um, a mission statement, it doesn't mean that everybody in my life um, has to have that. So my spouse might not be interested in having a family mission statement, but that doesn't change the fact that I can do it. I can make those changes. I can decide what is important to me. And if my spouse decides to do that um, as well, that's fabulous. But if they see that they don't feel that that would be something that's necessary for them, then that's okay too. Great, thank you. Sure. Any other questions that people have? We have about ten more minutes or so for questions, or if there's any topical things you'd like to discuss. So, um, so Carol, um, when when was the first time that you did the action plan? Um, have you already done one for the coming year for yourself? Well, well, I don't typically do mine for the coming year. It's kind of um, evolves. So I make sure that when I'm setting smart goals for myself, I set goals that are rather small because for me, it's easier to continue to achieve goals if I see some progress. So if I had a goal, and even if it was a SMART goal, if my goal was to um, save the world, and even if I could say that it's going to be specific in all of those steps, if it's too large for me, I lose focus and I lose my momentum. So for me personally, I like to have um, a list of, of things that I would like to work on, and then as I accomplish one piece of that, then I move on. So for me, one of the goals this year is do a lot more um, reading on, on wellness and on resiliency because I find those things very interesting, but because I train on it all the time, I don't really think about increasing my knowledge of the current information. So one of my goals is to make sure that at least once a month, I'm reading two new articles on resilience and wellness. Jennifer made an interesting comment that um, she's thinking about recruits at Academy since, and how to work this in for them, because most of them think that they are bulletproof. And um, so maybe if you have some um, hints on, to, on how one might sell this to someone who thinks they already know it all. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of interesting you say that because I was talking to a person one time who was doing some training on trauma, and I said, you know, how do you get buy-in? And what he said, which rings true here as well, let them know this will make them an even more efficient warrior. So this, you might know it all, but this is going to make every move that you make even better. So if you know how you're going to plan for your actions, then your instinct kicks in, but also you have a really good plan. So, um, so when you know if you're thinking about your life and and as a recruit, what is the plan for your life at work? Well, what are the milestones that you want to reach? So maybe you um, want to achieve a certain rank by a certain time, or maybe you want to look at your retirement already, and what are the steps that you need to create in your life to make that happen? Or maybe if it's a 20-something-year-old, make a, a plan of, um, these are the things that by the time I die, this is my bucket list. And then use it that way to, to um, get buy-in. It might be easier to get buy-in if you're using work life and home life. Um, and then I would all, you can also talk about the research behind it, showing that if we have the ability to plan for things 
And if we have the ability to use our resiliency skills, that's going to make us more efficient, better warriors. Yeah, and I know that we focus a lot of, uh, of attention when we do our day-long trainings in, um, with part of resiliency that is um, everybody already comes to the table with some resiliency. So even, even helping them identify in academy how they're already bringing things to the table that are resilient, it makes it that much more powerful if they put some intention behind that thing. So when we know that working out is one of the tools that we use, to help make ourselves more resilient or more efficient, then it makes it that much more strong in our neural pathway. And, and so it, it becomes then a more even ingrained and powerful choice. And, and also let them know that the skills that they can um, learn today will make their work more enjoyable, will make their overall um, everything that's going on in their life more enjoyable because if you are able to be more efficient in your work and you're able to have a plan and you're able to have a sense of control, then work doesn't seem so overwhelming and home doesn't seem so overwhelming. So all of the things, all of these skills are just going to make you one step above the average Joe who's going to um, the academy and just doing what he thinks is related or he or she thinks is related to what's necessary to learn in the academy. Right. I, um, I will reiterate that, yes, this will be available. Um, there will be a, a link to it, so it will be available on the um, NTAC YouTube channel, and you will be able to share this with uh, the link to, for other people. So we just have about four minutes left if anybody has any other questions. Um, I know that uh, for in, in our family, we try to have, we try to take a, a vacation. Uh, I have a 12-year-old son. We try to take one of our long weekends or something away, and we do a family meeting where we talk about what our goals are for the year, and we break things down that way. So I think this will work in nicely. I, I'm, I'm excited to, to try it um, with my own family. We're going to be, uh, actually this weekend, we're going to, have a little like family retreat kind of thing. So it'll be fun. Yeah. Well, and that's perfect because then not only are you getting to build your social support, build your communication, but you're teaching your son some skills that he can carry out into the world to make it easier for him. All of these things that we had to learn the hard way, if we can pass that along to others and they don't have to recreate the wheel or learn things the hard way, it will be better for all of us. And I, we talk a lot also in our training about purpose, and I think that that's terrific. The, the mission statement just helps us remember why we started doing this work, why what is important to us about the work that we do, and this mission statement only helps to articulate that, which I think is terrific from a professional standpoint. It's great to remember why it is we, we chose this, these areas to work in. It, it helps just direct our attention. Right. Um, someone okay. did um, point oh. out uh, the trauma stewardship uh, book. Yes. There's a book. Uh -huh. um, they posted that on here. I got a little bit behind. I'm not okay. seeing any more and questions, though. So. Right. And it's a wonderful book. It's a really good book, yeah. Okay. So I would um, suggest that we have about a uh, little less than two minutes. Um, so we will have, you will have this available to you. Also, you can check out the shiftwellness.org website. We put a lot of uh, um, resources up on the website, and we like to share a lot of different um, tools and techniques on the website. Also on our Facebook page, 
for Innocent Justice, uh, the Innocent Justice Foundation, we put, um, we try daily or every other day or so to be putting up um, information, whether it's, it's regarding um, uh, internet crimes against children, but also we quite often will put up articles about resiliency and wellness and things that we think will be useful to the public in general regarding building resiliency and wellness. And um, I, I'll hand it back over so, um, so that uh, Carol can wrap everything up. I want to thank you all for being here, and I'm sure Carol wants to say some final words. Yes, and I just wanted to say thank you all. If you have any questions, um, let's see if our contact, yes, here's our contact information. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Um, and, and let us know, and we'll be glad to help you out in any way we can. We all just love doing this work, and we all love being able to give some tools and techniques and, and just help people in their own lives to make things better. So please feel free to get a hold of us if you have any questions. And um, we really thank you for attending today, and thank you for sticking it out. Um, we see that most people were able to stay till the end, so that's great. But please feel free to get contact us and we will be happy to do what we can. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you. I appreciate that, um, uh, Carol, for a wonderful presentation. And of course, thank you, Beth. Um, and I just have a few brief announcements before we uh, wrap up today. Uh, again, thank you, Carol, for a great presentation. Oh, sure. And uh, as a reminder, the webinar recording will be archived in approximately one week on OJJDP's Intech YouTube channel, and support and resources can be obtained by contacting OJJDP's help desk. You may also contact OJJDP or Intech via help desk by following the contact information on this slide. And again, these slides are located in the handout pods as well. And just as a reminder, please remember that the attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via the Adobe Connect uh, system in the thank you email. Please keep an eye out on your email for your certificate. And remember, shortly you will receive a link to, the, to a brief survey about today's presentation. You may also click on the link on your screen now in order to access the survey. I'll give everyone just a few minutes to do so, a few seconds to do so. The feedback that you provide is uh, used to assist in future planning and training. And again, thank you all for joining us today. You all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.